Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, back with the second to last Greenskin Q&A episode. And today, we're going to be going over 40k. So how like 40k relates to Warhammer Fantasy and uh, stuff of that ballpark. So without further ado, let's hop into it. Our first question today comes from Decidia, who asks, Is there any mention of a Squigath in Fantasy... Or is it purely a 40k thing? So, the Squigoth, or Squigoth, is a exclusively Warhammer 40,000 monster. Though a very, very cool one. I love that thing in Dawn of War. The closest thing we have in comparison in fantasy is called the Colossal Squig, which are huge squigs. We're talking about squigs that are so big they can easily eat a troll in a single bite. Like, they're... they're monstrously sized and uh, you know funny enough when I actually think about it I think although the squigots are typically larger than the colossal squigs I think the colossal squigs actually have bigger mouths just because of the mouth to body ratio on regular squigs personally though the I do find the colossal squigs to be one of the scarier uh, I guess you could call them titanic monsters of the Warhammer Fantasy world as the thing about Colossal Squigs is they are freakishly fast because Squigs already can bounce to pretty absurd heights and very very alarming speeds um, when they like if they really get going they can be faster than horses a Colossal Squig those things can bounce very high like easily clear buildings if they get a really good bounce and the amount of speed they can cover is nasty plus because of the way squigs are physically when squigs die they tend to be like a balloon so they either can like pop or they deflate colossal squigs follow that same rule so when colossal squigs die they tend to explode because the stomach makes up such a massive amount of their body so it's like a rancid flesh balloon <laughs> full of acid that just goes kaboom and it just it is very very bad for your health to be standing anywhere close like they're basically walking bombs when they die so that's fun but that's the closest thing we don't have squigots next up we've got slanesh god of excess so why did the chaos dwarves make the hobgoblin slash black orcs and what's the difference in how the wall works from 40k and fantasy so, the first thing we've kind of already talked about, but just a TLDR, Hobgoblins were not made by Chaos Dwarves. They're a natural greenskin species. They just sided with the Chaos Dwarves in the big slave rebellion of Tsar Nagrund. And then the reason why the Chaos Dwarves made the Black Orcs is because they were trying to make the perfect slave. They wanted something that was really, really powerful could be used as like a really solid troop, but was also very, very tough to resist the natural um, rigors and heat of the furnaces they worked in and were brutally strong so they could heft around heavy war machines and parts and stuff like that. And then were focused so that they could actually follow orders and do complex tasks. The problem was that when they mixed all, thing, all those things together, they did not take into account the Greenskin's irrepressible sense of independence. So when they created these Black Orcs, the Black Orcs kind of looked around and were like, we should be in charge. And the whole thing happened. Uh, as for the difference between Wa Power and 40k and Fantasy, they, there are similarities, but in 40k, of course, 40k does not have magic. 40k has psychic powers, um, and that's kind of how the wall manifests is it's like a psychic to my understanding It's more like a psychic collective energy that builds up uh, Among the orcs and can actually manifest in genuinely frightening ways You know, especially when there are weird boys uh, to uh, Harness it and unleash it in powerful psionic abilities and stuff, but to the but with green skins there or sorry with orcs with a K uh, the 40k orcs have like a full-on uh, ability to alter reality due to their belief. You know, there's the famous sayings like red ones go faster, um, or I think purple is stealth and yellow is lucky, something like that. But 
the Greenskins have genuine beliefs and ideals that if enough of them believe in it in 40k, it it happens. Like it 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 physically manifests the way they believe it should. I think I've heard a joke saying that if enough orcs believe that if you were to take a stick and strap it to a rock, but you believed it could shoot, it could if enough orcs genuinely believed that. Fantasy has nothing like that. In fantasy, we just have magic. The only thing that Wa power does is it just in it's when the Greenskins build up enough, their hype and all of their um, emotions just are a blazing beacon with the winds of magic, and it just stirs up a storm that allows orc shamans and goblin shamans to reach into the winds of magic and bend it to their will and shoot it out in the form of spells. So they're very, very, very different things. Um, the only thing that I think is remotely similar is that if a lot of greenskins gather together, they get stronger. And if a lot of greenskins gather together and the boss yells wah, it's going to make all of the other orcs like go nuts and they like just go all in. So that's, but those are the only similarities as far as I understand it. Next we have EA Diaz who asks, are there any greenskin crafters, so to speak, uh, as they all have these crazy good magic weapons, armors, and items? We know they steal some, but are definitely not of other race designs. And his second question is, are there many types of squigs in fantasy as 40k? Because I can definitely see the squigeth working if they were ever to make savage orcs almost a separate entity. Expanding greenskin monsters could definitely be fun. So, uh, the first one we've definitely already talked about in a prior episode, but TLDR, all of the magic items by the greenskins are either stolen or were explicitly created by shamans um either by their own crazy minds or they basically had trances where they gazed into the great green and got inspiration from that other plane where gork and mork are to create the abominable magic weapons and armor and stuff that the greenskins use but most of it's loot or stuff that's been stolen by the greenskins and then forcefully transitioned to fit their purpose in fantasy compared to 40k i know in 40k there's so many types of squigs i know there are like hair squigs and f like i've i saw something at some point some kind of book or white dwarf article that went over how many different kinds of squigs there are in 40k and it's insanely long and in fantasy there is nothing that crazy there there are um there are a lot of squigs, though, uh, types in fantasy, but they're not as exotic, I'll say. It's mostly in fantasy that all squigs have a squig-like shape in that they are a creature that is round and has a very, very big mouth and two little, you know, like two bouncy legs, and they bounce and they eat. But sometimes there are mutations that create different species. Like, there are squigs that, um, in uh, Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning, they explored this a bit, in that they had, if you were a squig herder, you could have a gas squig, which was a squig that had, like, these big old, um, I don't know how to describe them, but uh, they had, like, these big pores on their back that they could shoot spores out of that were toxic. Um, there, and there were also spiky squigs, which were squigs that literally have spikes coming out of them that they could spasm and shoot the spikes out. So... In fantasy, there are crazy numbers of different kinds of squigs, but they're all very similar in design. And they vary from being very, very small to freaking massive, like the size of a giant. Um, well, not a giant. Well, yeah, actually probably a giant if you knew where to look. Like, there are, there are some bizarre creatures. Um, in Age of Sigmar, which is the continuation of Warhammer Fantasy after the world blew up, they have started following the 40k version where there are squigs of every shape, size, and variety you can possibly imagine. Like, there are squigs that look like stalactites. There are squigs that can fly. There are squigs that look like mushrooms. There are squigs that, like, anything that could... It, they're like mimics, almost, um, in Age of Sigmar. Not that they change form, but that they just look like something innocuous, and then you get close and they eat you. So... Uh, but, so, in fantasy, no, there's not as many squigs. Uh, okay, then we've got an Inquisitor in the house. Inquisitor Squish. Uh, let's see. What would you say is the biggest difference between 40k and fantasy greenskins? 
meaning cult but I mean it in a cultural mentality sense, not a gun and equipment sense. I would say that the biggest difference, in my opinion, and why I tend to much prefer fantasy green skins to 40k green skins is that in fantasy there's a much broader variety in the species that makes up green skins. Like green skins is a large racial group as opposed to just orcs, which 40k is primarily just orcs. They're all I think they do have grots which are goblins, but or at least I believe those are goblins. But in fantasy you have, you know, snotlings, goblins and orcs and there's so many different subspecies of those. And on top of that, or, you know what? They have I think it goes I think 40k has grots. I think it goes Orc, Grot, Gretchen, if memory serves, which is the equivalent to Fantasy's Orc, with a C, Goblin, Snotling, if memory serves. But, you know, but in Fantasy, we also have the Black Orcs, and the Hobgoblins, and the Noblars, and Night Goblins, and Forest Goblins, and Savage Orcs, and yada, yada, yada. But, um, so, to me personally... I, I think the biggest cultural difference would probably be that in fantasy, what can be like the main core of a greenskin army or who can be the leader of a huge wall is so much more up for grabs and fascinating because goblins can be bosses, um, hobgoblins can be bosses, um, uh, those and those are the biggest differences. You know, in 40k you just have orcs, 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 orcs. It's all orcs. That's all it is is orcs with a K. While it is in fantasy, you have Scarsnick and Grom the Paunch and Snagla Grobspit, and you have all these super powerful and influential characters who are goblins. Creatures that have some kind of exotic trait that allows them to take over rather than just being the biggest and baddest. Whereas in 40k, it seems almost exclusively that the bosses of the orcs are literally just the biggest, baddest orcs. In fantasy, there's a lot more variety on how an army is made up and who is leading it. You know, I, I could not ever imagine a character like Skarsnik um, existing in the 40k universe. I know they have, like, the Red Gabo, uh, I think is his name, but uh, or the Red Gretchen, whatever his, whatever his name is. But he seems more like a joke character, um, kind of like a, like a white dwarf specialty. He was just on the store a little bit ago. He was, like, the Christmas specialty model. Uh, he doesn't seem like a genuine serious contender slash threat among, like, the galaxy. Like Skarsnik is in the world and so on and so forth. So, I think culturally that's probably the biggest difference. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd probably say that. Um, that being said, you know, 40k does have its own strengths. Uh, we already talked about they have a much more fascinating squig culture. The squigs in... 40k are way more fleshed out and are a really significant part of green or orc culture um as opposed to just the, being like night goblin focused in fantasy um beyond that i mean all the green skins in 40k and fan well i the other i guess the other last thing i would say is that in 40k all green all orcs stop saying green skins all orcs follow the cultural culture of extreme belief and superstition for empowering their weapon uh weapons armor technologies um advancements their spaceships you know all that stuff that's that's like so core to what it is to be an orc and to my understanding that's all orcs in fantasy that is purely the savage orcs um, the Savage Orcs are the only... There's not even a Goblin race that does this, but the the Savage Orcs are the only part of fantasy greenskin culture that has... that have belief as a part of their system. You know, they believe that their tattoos protect them, so they do. Granted, not super duper well, but, you know, it genuinely works, um, even if the effect is very minor. Um, to my understanding, 40k Orcs, on the other hand... That is like, that's their thing, is that they all believe in, uh, they all have that soup. They're, they're all like savage orcs, except for they're not savages, obviously. They, they like, 
they like their shooters and their flashy gits and all the other crazy awesome stuff so those would be the biggest differences in my opinion all right next up is faba uh he asks i'm a big 40k orc fan was wondering if the green skins of fantasy can create their own habitable habitable environment like the 40k orcs can like the fungus providing breathable air and food for the orcs also what role do goblins have in green skin society so uh green skins in fantasy don't terraform they just adapt to their environment they more adapt to their environment as opposed to changing their environment to suit them if that makes sense for instance you have uh you know if go when goblins moved down deep beneath the earth and they lived in all those dark caves and stuff they adapted to become night goblins which are now a fairly unique species when all the goblins moved into the forests, uh, the deep dark forests and among the spiders and all that crazy stuff, over generations they evolved into forest spider or uh, forest goblins. Uh, orcs, you know, the black orcs were created by magic and demonology, whereas savage orcs tend to live in areas where it's all wasteland or there's a lot of large monsters to hunt and there's not a lot of natural resources for them to farm iron or metals or create their own stuff so uh in that sense greenskins definitely cannot do that fancy you know they can't uh, change the world itself that they're in you know they don't move in somewhere and uh, change it to suit them however there are things they do to make life easier for them you know when greenskins do set up a base which is kind of rare but when they do it uh, like when they take over a really big dwarf hole, for instance, like Carrick Eight Peaks or Black Crag, there are functioning systems that are put in place that uh, have, you know, where they have like mushroom caves that they farm or certain kinds of animals that they farm, like squigs or maybe some kind of monster or beast like that. But they're they're not advanced <laughs> and they're not sophisticated. As for what role goblins have in greenskin society, goblins do literally everything. Um, they're kind of the sneakier and more... Uh, they're a lot more clever than orcs. So when it comes to inventing and bothering at all with technology, goblins. Um, smiths are generally going to be orcs, but like everything else, the, like the guys who build the chariots... The guys who build all the different kinds of war machines. The guys who man the war machines. The guys who uh, tame wild beasts. Goblins. Because it requires tact and intelligence. The guys who tend to deal, go catch trolls. Goblins. The guys who tend to talk to giants and get them to like follow instructions. Goblins. Um, so that that's kind of... And they do get bullied around by greenskins a lot. Um, most of the time when goblins... Are like the upper echelon of a tribe it's because it's a pure goblin tribe in which case they do everything uh, there are exceptions of course like Grom the Paunch who was a goblin that got so big that orcs couldn't beat him up and couldn't bully him and he could just kill them and eat them so in his society goblins managed to like fight their way up the food chain big time but then you have goblins like Skarsnik who just through his sheer cleverness and genius came comes out on top and uses a lot of really cunning tactics to put and his army is like 90 percent like his leadership is 90 percent goblins with 10 percent orc and the 10 percent orc is just there to keep the other orcs in line um so uh but generally goblins are the thinkers they're the they're the builders or the crafters or the you know uh tamers and D diplomats of greenskin society but they're also the assassins the backstabbers and they get the crap and they get bullied a lot which unfortunately has a nasty habit of turning them into vindictive little assholes who really 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 enjoy torturing other things when they get the chance but hopefully that answers that question but they are they are different but equal to orcs even though the orcs would not tell you that if you asked orcs orcs would say that goblins are all below them and just are there to be kicked around and smacked a bit you know smacked around a whole bunch but it's it's a lot more complicated than that john blankenship has a bunch of questions here but let's knock them out so and i'm gonna i'm gonna 
ask it and then answer it because there are so many of them. Actually, you know what? Whatever. We'll just ask them all at once because it'll be easier to write it down. So first, who was the biggest, most powerful orc in history? Two, who had the largest and most powerful wall in history? Three, how big can an orc get? And he talks about how big the 40k ones are. Four, wh where do greenskin armies get all of their material to make weapons and armor? Five, have there ever been chaos orcs? Six, what is the most power... What is the most powerful thing greenskins can get their hand on? Monster, you know, like, of any category. Like, what's the most powerful thing, period? Seven... Do orcs ever use captured black powder weapons or chemical weapons? Eight. Uh, have the greenskins ever united under one leader? Could they ever unite again, uh, under one leader? Um, and what would the goal be of a giant wall if they did unite? And then nine. Who is the oldest orc to ever live? Okay. So first, who's the biggest, most powerful? Grimgore Ironhide by far. Uh, Grimgore is the biggest, hardest orc that's ever lived. And it's because he's a black orc, which gives him kind of an unfair advantage. But among the black orcs, he's the biggest and baddest. And black orcs are already the biggest and baddest of all orcs. Um, the greatest wa is debatable. Um, I would probably say the greatest wa to... Ev the largest wa to ever exist was the one led by Vorbad Ironjaw who uh, we talked extensively about in a previous episode, um, uh, who was the orc that fought Sigmar Heldenhammer in Blackfire Pass. The scariest Wa to ever live, though, was easily the Wa, uh, Wa Ironclaw, which was led by Gorbad Ironclaw, who was the only orc to ever live that had a really, really good grasp of tactics. And it made him basically unstoppable until he, until he basically lost control of his army. But uh, he wrecked the Empire so bad. And the Dwarves. But uh, he completely wiped out an Imperial province. Uh, the third one was... Where did they get all the stuff? We kind of... We basically talked all about... Oh, how big can an orc get? Sorry. Uh, the biggest an orc can get... Um, not... I mean, technically there's no upper limit. Because orcs always get bigger the longer they live. But the largest orc we've ever seen is probably Grimgore. And he's a little, he's a roughly the size of a troll. So he's, so Grimgore is probably in that like 10 to 12 foot ballpark. But he might, but that would be probably if he stood at his full height. I'm not exactly sure how Grimgore, how tall he would look. Because he wears so much armor. That's so heavy. It literally weighs him down like compresses him a little bit um even though it doesn't slow his movement at all because he's just that strong but grimgore is the largest orc that we know of there have been a lot of big orcs but i have never heard of an orc like notably larger than a troll uh, they don't get like the 40k orcs they don't get to the size of like pieces of terrain or anything crazy like that uh four where do they get all their equipment we've already gone over that in prior episodes really really heavy five has there been a chaos orc no uh, six, what is the most powerful thing orcs can get their hand on? Uh, the most powerful thing greenskins have ever ha been able to get their grubby paws on are known as great, great rogue idols of Gork, which are without a doubt the most powerful monstrosity the greenskins can unleash. Um, I've talked about them in prior episodes, but they are these huge golems. And a, a great idol is the biggest kind. And we are literally talking about a monster that is so freaking big that it can, it can, it is like the, it is at or above a giant's height. And you really need to go in and look carefully at how tall the giant is compared to even other monsters. The great idols of Gork are colossal. Um, it, it takes an absurd amount of wah um to uh what like magic and uh to even get one to work much less control one but they have it has happened um in storms of magic and when that does happen it is bad news for anybody else um a great idol is virtually unstoppable because it, it's it's like fighting a mountain like it's 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 insane um uh next up 
is do orcs ever use black powder or chemical weapons it it has happened but it's super duper duper rare um i talked about i want to say four or five episodes ago there was one particular warlord who i believe was a goblin war boss who captured a war machine train of black powder weapons from the dwarves and he went on a deadly campaign before he was finally stopped um so they they can use them but they don't know how to make them and when they do get them if they're able to figure out how to make it work it is it is truly devastating like it knocks the green skins up to easily one of one of if not the most dangerous army on the face of the planet thankfully very very rare for the green skins to get their hands on it um and even if they do get their hands on it it has to be super freaking sturdy for the green skins not to accidentally break it while they're trying to figure out how to learn to use it and the races that do have very sturdy war machines being the dwarves are usually very good about exploding their own war machines rather than letting uh, them fall into enemy hands then we've got uh could they ever unite under a single leader so uh very unlikely green skins are very fractitious and they suffer really really bad from uh, infighting like even even on a battlefield where there's like maybe a few you know a couple few thousand orcs all on the same team fighting a super obvious enemy they will still start fighting and squabbling with each other while they're just waiting to get to the front lines so the thought of the entire planet uniting under a single orc is not realistic in the slightest um however there it was attempted by Wurzag the great green prophet but his goal was to unite all the orcs and goblins under um what he thought of as basically the avatars of gork and mork which his objective was to get grimgore ironhide as the avatar of gork and scar snake as the avatar of mork but he wasn't able to pull it off um during the end times because he, scar snake basically got taken out of the picture before words that could get to him but um and then the last thing is who's the oldest orc to have ever lived huh <sighs> that's super hard to answer uh because orcs are really really crap at keeping track of anything in their own history at all like if you're getting a green skin to even know its own age is hilariously difficult but the oldest green skin to have ever lived i mean it, that's pretty much impossible to say the oldest one alive right now is probably grimgor maybe gorfang rotgut maybe wurzag uh it's hard to say maybe zardok the mad uh is his name Zar? i think his name's zardok um uh who's a mad uh wizard that hangs out with gorfang um but it it's literally impossible to say we we know that orcs are functionally immortal uh at least by age so long as they can eat breathe drink uh <laughs> and fight they have to be able to fight otherwise they start to suffer from age uh, like they start to deteriorate um but i i, I would think grimgore ironhide is the oldest and the, the reason i say that is because and i talk about this in grimgore's um history uh, if you ever go want to go watch my grimgore ironhide video but grimgore seems to have come from czar nagrund itself which if that is true means that he is at least like a thousand um probably like two thousand years old which seems very unlikely based on how horrifically aggressive he is that he wouldn't have like made a noticeable dent in the world's history by then um but it's it's difficult to work out the math on that so i don't know is the honest question because there's just there's no resources at all to help figure that out we know there are some very we know orcs easily make it over 100. um there are plenty of orcs hanging around who have been around for a few hundred years at least but um any like in the thousands category nobody for certain next up squeak footbiter are greenskins similar to orcs in 40k in the aspect that what they believe becomes reality um like red weapons are sharper because they believe uh, weapons that are red are sharper than others no um the only th that is not how fantasy works but it well kind of the only great and we talked about this already but the only thing that works for are savage orcs savage orcs uh paint themselves up with tattoos um 
that they really, really, really believe will protect them from harm. And very rarely it sometimes works. <laughs> you know, like it'll turn aside a blade at the last second or cause an arrow to like veer off path or a bullet or it might cause a fireball or a spell to sizzle out right before it hits them. So it happens, it's just relatively rare. Um, you know, in, in fantasy tabletop, it was represented by a one out of six chance. So it's not, it doesn't happen very much. Uh, it happens enough that the Savage Orcs are comfortable believing in that as their only defense, but it does not happen enough that it has worked very reliably for them. <laughs> they still rely much more on their strength, speed, and numbers than their defense. But the rest of the Greenskins absolutely don't believe any of that um, and don't even bother with it. Uh, the Help Mayo. Are there any big different... Uh, we already answered that, but thanks for your question. Uh, Finian Chief. How large is the greenskin presence in Nagarond? Do they live there like they do in the Darklands and the Badlands due to how hostile and monster-rich it is? Or do Dark Elves keep their numbers there mostly in check? Also, are there orc pirates like the Freebooters in 40k, but in fantasy? So, yes, there are tons of greenskins in Nagarond, and they are a permanent problem that the Dark Elves cannot get rid of. Like, they keep them in check, but they can't get rid of them, because getting rid of greenskins is literally impossible. Um at least in feasible means uh terms and yes there are orc pirates we talked about them extensively last episode uh iapetus iapetus asks how much daca is enough there's never enough daca unless you're in fantasy in which case it's only those weird error boys but in 40k never enough daca always need more daca voltmeister uh, he asks us, does a colorblind greenskin think green ones go faster? In 40k, probably. In fantasy, no, because that's ridiculous. Uh, Gojira, are hair squigs a thing? Not in fantasy. Rikidos, if orcs and goblins were to amass, would they be able to create more advanced technologies like the greenskins do in 40k? Only snotlings, which I talked extensively about snotling pump wagons two episodes ago. But um, regular greenskins do not have the bizarre ingrained sense of technological in, uh, invention that 40k orcs do. If a bunch of greenskins get together, they're going to go fight something. But they, they will not build anything um, like they do in 40k. The only thing that does that are snotlings. I don't know why it's just the snotlings and nobody else, but it's just the snotlings. And then today's last question comes from Fewer. Hey, Fewer. Which... He asks, similar to a question that Dad Orc Boss asked uh, in a previous video, um, uh, has there ever been a time where enough greenskins have congregated together that they actually develop their own structures and architecture, or have they and will they always just squat in and destroy other people's homes? So, so yes when a lot of greenskins get together and they set up like they find a livable space whether it's a massive cave or a particularly high point on a wasteland or you know a special place in the jungles or whatever they will eventually start to build a base of sorts you know they'll start to just put orc uh, iconography on everything you know they'll smear their dung all over it they'll dig the these big trenches which are called the drops which are used for uh defecating all that crap uh, see what i did there but <laughs> on accident but um they don't like build anything of substantial note it there are greenskin fortresses that were built purely by the greenskins they do exist they are freakishly rare uh, I know there's one in the Marshes of Madness, but but even then, 99% of the time, every greenskin settlement or encampment or structure or whatever is going to be something that was owned by a different race that was actually civilized and started building their home there, and the greenskin showed up and just, just freaking annihilated everything. And the greenskins... I would say most of the time you should consider them as destroyers, not creators. The only time they create is generally to deface everything 
to look like their favorite god of choice. Um, that being said, when they do set up shop, like in Karakate Peaks or Black Crag or uh, Iron Rock or any of those settlements, they will build really impressive, terribly constructed, and not at all up to safety standard, but impressive um, settlements in those. Like, they'll build these huge ramshackle cities that are almost entirely made out of animal skins, wood, and then just whatever garbage they can find. You know, dung, mud, stone, um, random bits of metal, scrap pieces, corpses. Like, they'll just use whatever they can find. Um, but they... You would never ex you would never come across an orc city that came out of nothing. It virtually always will be something that they built because that place was important due to violence. That is a guarantee. The only reason they're going to build something there is because it's a place where violence happens frequently. Which means that whatever they're using to build it and whatever they're generally building on but once belonged to somebody else. Whether that was dwarves, lizardmen, elves, men, uh, ogres, tomb kings, vampire counts. It, you know, who knows who they stole it from or who it used to belong to, but it's theirs now. And they improve upon it with their own designs and, you know, they just build ramshackle crap so that they can all fit in there. You know, they'll add these leaning towers that are super rickety and very unreliable but they're just like yeah whatever they're very much like skaven in that regard um skaven are almost the exact same but skaven have a little more ingenuity in that skaven actually do specifically build certain kinds of structures you know they'll build um like massive mechanical marvels or and things to create power and light and lighting and they'll use you know laboratories and all this other crap Greenskins, best case scenario, they'll have uh, the boss will usually have his a throne room of some sort, which is usually a dwarven, somebody else's throne room that he has decided is his now, and defaced it with a bunch of like furs and random stuff. They'll usually have a loot room where they keep the loot pile, which is going to be a mess. And then everything else is just kind of like where they could fit stuff. Uh, they might have animal pins. Uh, best case scenario, they'll build really crappy towers where they'll put, like, goblin spear chuckas or rock lavas up there. <laughs> like, that's, that's like when you're starting to get into advanced territory. Um, but yeah, no. They're, they, you will never come across an orc city that was built from the ground up by orcs. It will always be built on the bones of somebody else. And, I mean, the orcs... Most greenskins are too lazy, or not... Mm. Most greenskins are not focused enough to build a city. Um, it's almost always somebody else's stuff that they took, and because it was defensible, and because they fought a really hard fight to win it, and it's awesome, and there's lots of loot, they just start stacking up on it until it kind of turns into a formidable fort, not because it was meant to, but because there's just so much garbage that it's genuinely difficult to get through it. And the Greenskins, who have always lived there, know their way around really, really well. So, there you go. Hopefully that answers all your questions. Uh, that's it for the 40k section. So, tomorrow we will be hitting up the... Uh, tomorrow we will hit up the special characters episode. And that's the end. That's the very last Greenskin episode. And I believe we'll have come out to 15... 30 minute plus episodes. So that's... That's... Over... What? 300 and... Oh gosh. I'm gonna brain fart. No, that's like 450 minutes of greenskin lore. Anyway. Thank you all so much for watching. And don't forget, tomorrow at the end... End of tomorrow's episode... I will be announcing who the next race is for the Q&A to follow after that. So without further ado, guys, have a great day.